Well, my first guest was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom for more than 10 years. When he swept to power in 1997, he quickly made peace in Northern Ireland his main priority. He also oversaw some of Britain's most prosperous years, but his tenure wasn't without its share of controversy. His decision to involve his country in wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan seriously divided public opinion. He's just released his autobiography, and I'm happy to say he's here with us tonight. Would you welcome, please, Mr. Tony Blair. Thank you very much. It's good to be here, Ryan. You decided to go for the tie in the end. I did. Well, you look so smart. I thought I can't be uh, letting the show down. I know, but I thought you were going to go for a casual look this evening. I'm surprised. Well, when I saw how elegant you looked... Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> I thought... Here we go. Yeah. This is what you do. Actually, what, what actually happened was I was in two minds as to whether to do it or not. And if I'm actually honest about it, I grabbed this tie from someone in the corridor. So <laughs> did you? I'll give it back to him after the show. <laughs> I hope you like it. You better. You're, I think people mightn't be aware of your connection with Ireland. I mean, it's, 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 it runs deep. It's, it's very real. Uh, tell us about it. Well, my mother was, was Irish. Uh, she lived in Donegal. Yeah. Uh, it, she was brought up there. And um, my grandfather was actually, he was a farmer yeah. there. And so we used to go back to, to uh, Ireland every summer for our holidays. We used to go to a place called Rasnala. Yes, it was there um, recently. Yes. In the Sands House Hotel. Yes. Uh, and, you know, that's where I learned to swim, it's where I learned to play the guitar and various other things. Yeah, I'm not going to let you away with that. What else did you learn there? <laughs> things that young people learn, but it was um, oh, no, what a I good got? place to have the education. <laughs> no, actually, I remember t chasing my, uh, actually, one of my first, and I may say highly unsuccessful experiences with girls, <laughs> was, uh, was in the Sands House Hotel, yeah. and I had my first drink, not actually there, but when I was on holiday there. Okay, so there we are. At the age of 18, of course. Of course. Yeah. Funny enough, I don't believe that one either. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that was all part of it. Uh, your grandmother, as you write in your book, uh, had a message for you on pretty much her deathbed. It was a, kind of an interesting thing for a woman who wasn't so well, but she had that moment of lucidity. It was an extraordinary thing because my, um, uh, my grandparents actually were very, very staunch Protestants. Yes. Uh, indeed, my uh, grandfather um, was, a, was an orange man, fierce on, on all that. And my grandmother, uh, towards the end of her life, she'd been very ill with uh, Alzheimer's, but she just had one moment of lucidity, um, literally just a short time before she died, when she grabbed my hand when she, she was lying in bed, and she said, son, whatever else you do, don't marry a Catholic. Uh, <laughs> Which, of course, I ended up doing, but... Uh, <laughs> um, she, she hadn't met it was one of these, at that stage. No, it was a, no, she hadn't, actually, which yeah. is why it was such a strange thing. But it was one of these things, and it always stuck with me, because I remember thinking, she was a lovely woman in every respect. Yeah. But this one, yeah. where there was this, this, this deep residue mm. of prejudice. This was your was first experience of what you might call emotional sectarianism, I mean, coming from it quite firsthand. Yeah, although, actually, what had happened, we used to go literally every summer... Um, to, to Ireland, and then when the troubles began, we, we stopped. You stopped, 1969. Yeah, we really stopped, and it was interesting. I used to get letters from from friends who were there, and you could see the bitterness and the, could you? And the dislike coming in. And it was really sad because it was a, you know, Ireland's a fabulous country, the people are great, and yet yeah. you had this, this this thing that just sort of, you know, pulled apart a community and and mm. made people hate each other really which was which was tragic so did this of course informed what you would do later on in life Let, let's bounce forward we'll, we'll bounce around your experience if you yeah. don't mind and we'll get to the idea of, of you then getting to 10 downing street and it seems from what you've been saying recently that you had decided that northern ireland was going to be a priority and you also write in the book very eloquently if i may say that it wasn't necessarily something that was going to make you very popular at home and if it failed it would have made you deeply unpopular across the water why would you take on such a beast I don't know. I just felt that it, it could be done, that it should be done. And um, I think partly because of my experience, actually, when I was a, a child growing up, mm -hmm. I th just thought here we were approaching the millennium, yeah. um, the 21st century, and we still had what appeared to be such a, a bitter and old-fashioned divide in a way. And, and so I, I decided that even though it was obviously going to be difficult, why not give it a go? 
Yes, and you talk about the economic uh, maturation, if you like, of Ireland. Now, it seems to have been somewhat of a falsehood, but nevertheless, there were good times happening here, and you f felt that that was something that could have helped you across the line. Yeah, I also think things were changing. You know, the Republic of Ireland was changing, a new generation of people was coming on, and, you know, in the end, uh, we're all, one of the things you, you learn about the world today is we're all, I mean, Ireland's a small country, the UK is a small country in the world that's developing right. today. You know, you go to China today and you see a, the ch population of China increasing every year by the total population of the UK. Mm. You realise in, in context, this world, yeah. yeah, let's come on, we can get over this dispute and live together peacefully. Let's talk about some of the players. You, you were dealing with some characters. Yeah, you were dealing with some. Uh, they, were, they all were quite colourful in some ways. Some dark colours, some bright. But let's talk one way or the other about Bertie Ahern, a figure, great, uh, uh, well, a, a, a huge political figure in this country, irrespective of your politics. Uh, what, what was it about Bertie Ahern that struck you uh, when you met him first and started doing business with him? Um, he was totally aware of Irish history. Yeah. But he wanted to move beyond it. And in that, we kind of shared something. And, and we were, you know, he became a very good friend, is a very good friend of mine. He, he just behaved with extraordinary skill towards this thing, because it was difficult. Mm. You know, it touches deep into Irish politics. Mm. Um, the politics of Northern Ireland are obviously incredibly complicated. And both of us, in a sense, had the same feeling about mm. it, that it might be difficult, but it was worth trying to do and, and, and worth trying to solve. The previous Taoiseach of this country used a word to describe Bertie Ahern, and I, it jumps out of your book, uh, I have to say, vividly, uh, which was the word cunning. You said he was cunning, and you also qualified by saying, and I mean that in a good way, as only you could. Um, <laughs> uh, why use that word in any way? Because sometimes you, you've got to be smart to get around these problems. Yes. I mean, they require creativity, they require imagination, and they require an ability to get to where you need to get to. By um, cunning. Yeah, and that's cunning in the best sense of the word. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was really hard because you were having conversations with people, particularly when you sat down with the, you know, the Sinn Féin people um, and the unionists. These are people who had a bitter entrenched hatred. Yes. Um, so you required a bit of cunning to get through that. Ian Paisley. I'm about to alienate everyone here, but I actually got to, to like him. <laughs> but he, he became more likable as he got older, as you know. Um, yeah, and he, look, it's a, it's a funny thing. I, you know, I speak as I find, which is probably the best way to do it. And, well, uh, let's go back to the beginning. You said you got to like him. Obviously, it wasn't all good at the beginning. No, it was Why very not? difficult at the beginning because he was very much in the no camp. <laughs> um, so you face him in a room and he's going, no, no, never, never, never. And yeah. how do you feel as Prime Minister dealing with that negativity? I think, how do I overcome it yeah because there's no point in getting upset by it because it's a fact and you can see that and there were plenty of no naysayers on the other side too but as time went on I, we, we established a, a kind of relationship yeah. and I think in the end he wanted to you know he wanted to do what was right for his people I mean and and and, and did and the did, fact, did old age help that I don't know a sometimes sense of mortality if you like I, I, I think yes I think there's a certain mellowing yeah. that can happen um, and, you know, when I sat, actually, when, when we finally got the whole thing together, literally weeks before I left office in 2007, and there was Martin McGuinness sitting with Ian Paisley. Yeah. And it was just such a strange, to, to anyone brought up in the politics of this whole thing, mm -hmm. it was such a strange and extraordinary sight. And, you know, it was one of the few times in politics I felt really proud, actually. Jerry Adams. Um, tough, clever, but he would, needed to be... Uh, uh, both of those things to lead his party from where it was to where difficult it was. Difficult man? It. Everyone was difficult in that situation. Um, likeable man? Uh, I grew to like him. I know, I know that makes me uh, strongly criticise in parts of the North, but, you know, I worked with uh, Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness really closely. Do you remember when Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams and Mo Molum and yourself were sitting in that room in Downing Street? <laughs> no, I remember they, they came into yeah. the Downing Street room and it was, you know, they were talking rather eloquently about the history and Michael Collins and sitting in this room and everything. And then Mo, who is, of course, absolutely, uh, you know, iconoclastic and would say whatever she wanted to say at any point in time. She said, I know, isn't it, isn't it nice? And that's the window that you fired the mortar in at John Major. And it's, <laughs> it's, right. It's, I said, Thanks, Mo. We'll get that in just a little moment. Uh, <laughs> Did you feel like telling her to shut up? <laughs> no, essentially... <laughs> Did you, Quite happy uh, you, you talk about the uh, indeed. You talk about the uh, styles of negotiating between the Republicans and the Unionists. Uh, they, it, it, the, the only word I can think of is stark. Characterise them yeah. for us, if you would. 
the unions tend to be very, very literal, yeah. everything very direct. Sure. And the Republicans, partly because of the way that they, uh, you know, had to, to be over a period of time, they were very, you know, it was a lot easier, a lot more sort of subtle. Um, and I suppose, you know, they, they were in a sense, um, you know, they, they, they had to be like that because of the politics they'd grown up in. But it was a very, very sharp difference in the two styles. Um, and, you know, I'm, I actually used to find it very helpful as well to come and understand Irish politics. And I, obviously, as the, we got the process underway, I actually ca I came and addressed the Doyle. The Doyle, yeah. Yes, which was, uh, was a great uh, occasion I really enjoyed doing. And, you know, so I was also getting some sense of where Irish politics was and placing yes. them in the context not just of Northern Ireland politics, but of Irish politics. Okay. Did you ever at any point, I mean, I was reading at one stage, I think it was about two pages you were describing an episode in Northern Ireland, the word unreasonable was used, I'd say, up to maybe 10 to 15 times. I mean, it, it, unreasonable. This was unreasonable. You, in fact, you rewarded, I won't say who, but you rewarded a man, what you said, described as being the Olympic medal for being unreasonable. Um, <laughs> did you ever think at one stage, you guys, I'm walking away. Did you ever feel like turning your back on this thing? No, I didn't, funnily enough. Um, and now I do the Middle East uh, peace process with the Israelis and Palestinians. I feel the same way. I feel it can be settled. Uh, it's difficult because of the history. You actually can't blame people, in a sense, for being unreasonable. They've been through really hard times, yeah. and you've just got to carry on going the whole time. I want to ask you, uh, as an aside uh, from the peace process, in slightly more jocose vein, um, about the moment when you stood on the steps and said, uh, this is a very important moment in history. It's not the time for sound bites. And what was the next line? I feel the hand of history on my shoulder. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. I you, know. You, you delivered the biggest sound bite of all time. It was out of my mouth, and I thought, what an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember seeing Alistair Campbell, my press guy, who's I think has been on your show in the background, rolling his eyes and putting his hand to his head. And then I said, I think I'll go back in now. So I did. Why did you feel like an idiot? Because I just said, I'm not, this is not a time for <laughs> sound bites. And then out it came. you might say that was a sound bite, yeah. Was it an accident? Actually, it was an accident, yes, because the, the fact is I really didn't mean to do it. It's just the, the, the phrase came to me, as yeah. sometimes they, these things do. So you couldn't resist it, out it came. Out it came. Talk to me about life in Downing Street as the father of young children. Um, obviously, the, the Downing Street hadn't echoed to the sound of children's feet for quite some time until you arrived. Um, was, it, was it difficult? Uh, was it awkward? Was it, was it fun at all? Or? Um, yeah, no, it was. It, it, it was fun. Uh, you know, I was, I think, the first person to have a child born to them in Downing Street for about 130 years or something, yeah. uh, which makes you wonder what the other prime ministers were doing. But it's a... Um, <laughs> Working but, probably. Yeah, but I think that the, the fact of having a, a young family there yeah. was at one level made it a lot more difficult. At another level, it keeps you grounded. And, yeah. and, and then when Leo was born, obviously, in, in the year 2000, it was fabulous. And was Leo a surprise or a shock? To uh, uh, both. <laughs> um, you were yeah. about to say totally something. I was about to say t totally a surprise, and then I realised you'd said shock, and I thought, yes, that too. Um, yeah, no, what he was, it was a, but it was a pleasant uh, surprise. A, yeah, it was a gift from God. I, I, I think he's. He, he, we were very blessed. Yeah. You also had this. You know, we have what's called the junior shirt. I think you have is it the GCSEs when when the children or the, the the youngsters hit a certain. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, you're grimacing already. I can tell. Um, but a lot of of the teenagers get the results and they go out on the tear and they have a few jars and yeah. it gets a bit ugly. And you got a phone call one night about you. Um, who called you and to say what? Well, I noticed he wasn't in the house and Cherie was actually away. Uh, with Leo at the time and I knew he'd gone out to celebrate and now I have to say this because my son Ewan said to me there's only two things you said about me in this book oh, yeah. uh, one is that I got drunk and the other is I didn't do very well in my GCSEs and yeah. he said do you mind saying something nice about me he's turned into a wonderful there you go. Yeah, good man <laughs> <laughs> and he has thank God for that um, but no, I got, I got a, uh, I, so I had to try and track him down. Yeah. And I, 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 uh, what did the phone call say? The phone call said, was from his friend, who wasn't in great shape, actually, who said, I last saw him and he was wandering in the direction of Leicester, Leicester Square. Square. He was locked, yeah. yeah. So what did I do? Because the trouble is I'm Prime Minister, I'm sitting <laughs> in Downey Street, right? So I, I, I dash down to the front door and then I think, I can't just walk out and go <laughs> searching at Leicester Square. Ah, Not a wise a idea for, for a politician that, yeah. that uh, time so um, so I just said to the police guy on the door help me yeah which he did 
uh, and he went off and he found you and brought him back about you know, I don't know, it must be about 1.30 in the morning. Poor guy was very much worse, worse for wear. And the, the, the irony was actually that the next day I'd held this big, because he was, I'm afraid, under, underage, and so there, he had been arrested, <laughs> all the rest of the poor, poor kid. And the next day I'd actually previously arranged to do a big special on yeah. the television uh, all about crime, antisocial behavior. And, <laughs> and the, so it was just, it was yeah. one of those unhappy coincidences and things. Yeah, but, so bad but it was, timing for you. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, no, it was, it was, look, it was great to have a family in Downing yeah. Street. And I think one of the things I've tried to do in the book is, is write it in a personal way, make it more human. And, and you do that when you talk about, say, for example, Princess Diana, the late Diana, and you, you describe her, you say she flirted. She was extraordinarily captivating. Were you, were you, were you smitten by her? She was a beautiful woman. Were you smitten and by I'm, her? And, and I'm a man, so draw uh, whatever conclusions you wish. I'll from say that. you were smitten uh, by her. Um, no, I wouldn't say that, but I would. Uh, she was a wonderful person to be around. Attractive. Yeah, and fantastically attractive. But she was also, which is really what I described, she was in a very smart person yeah. as well, a really clever person. You talk about the Queen, and you say that you, she's somebody that's real, real personable but with you, but you don't get, to use your own word, matey with her because you say she'll shoot you a look. Could you show me that look? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, only she could show you that look. Could you give me an idea? And Ryan, I'm not sure you'll get her for next year, but... Uh, you never know. <laughs> well, you never She's know. She's meant to be in town. Yeah, well, yeah, well Have there, you, with her, there you go. What sort of, is it a stern school marm look? Um, it's, she, look, she's the queen. I know that. So there's no messing about, ultimately. She is the queen, but she's was incredibly good and gracious to me all the time I was, I was in office, I have to say. So, um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's incredibly difficult yeah. for the royal family because they have to, in today's world, have to be more human in a sense, but also they have to guard some of the mystique of the monarchy. What did you make of George W. Bush when you first met him? When I first met him, um, it was sort of, we were just of different political parties. I'd been a really close friend of Bill Clinton's. Yeah. And um, it was, you know, it was fine because he's, he's a perfectly nice did, guy did to get like on with. Did you like him? Did you feel I, I liked him perfectly much, but we had different political views. Yeah. So we were a long way apart on, on, on that. But, um, and, you know, it probably would have stayed that way, but for September the 11th, frankly. Where were you on the September the 11th, 9-11? I was just about to address the uh, Trade Union Congress in yeah. Brighton. What happened? And... I remember literally just going over my speech um, just before it happened um, and then someone came in to me and you know I don't like to get interrupted when you're just putting the finishing touches in yes. your speech so I knew it must be important and said I think you better watch this on the television um, and then as the events unfolded it became clear this was a, a massive attack and, and a very serious one. What went through your head? It was funny really I mean I, I strange I thought very much of all the, the human suffering, but I also had a, a sense of clarity that, that this was a defining moment. Um, because the numbers of people killed were so large, and, and I think the, the crucial thing which made all the difference really to, my, to them, my worldview, frankly, was they did kill 3,000 people, but they, if they could have, it would have been 30 or 300,000. And it defined what for you? It clarified what exactly? It defined that this extremist threat that we were facing yes. was uh, fundamental and had to be confronted. You became um, deeply associated with George W. Bush politically and, and later, laterally, militarily, I suppose. And as that relationship was growing, uh, you were characterized as Bush's poodle. Um, and when you saw the newspapers and you were, you know, your face was put on the body of a poodle and so forth, and it was kept coming up and again and again, his lapdog, his poodle. Uh, Nelson Mandela referred to you as America's foreign minister at one stage. But particularly the poodle issue. What? Look, How do you deal with that? You don't. You, you kind of rise above it. Because in today's politics, you, you will get a lot of criticism. And the moment you decide, you divide. So... You've just got to get used to that, and if you can't stand the heat, don't come in the kitchen. How uh, did you discuss religion with George Bush privately? No, I, this is one of the great myths. Uh, no, I didn't. Um, never? Well, never discuss religion. I can't remember. But You're a I, religious person, aren't you? I am a religious and person. And he's a religious person. He is a religious Born again. person. So would it ever, the train have met then on occasion over yeah, but coffee? Yeah, we're, we're not kind of talking, you know, we're talking about foreign policy and security. Yeah, but would it not veer into, say, something that you would share an interest in, for example? No, no, religion? not particularly. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, 
sometimes people talk to you about these things as if you know, religion's what motivates your, your decisions. It's, yeah. it's not like that. I, mean, I, wasn't, someone, I wasn't asking no, you that. I was but, asking, did you discuss religion no, with them casually? Mean, I, it, it, Casually, in the sense of obviously, this extremism's got its religious basis. So, in that sense, of course. Yeah. Um, Did you ever pray with him? No, never. No. Now you're looking at me as if to say, "Don't be so ridiculous." No, well, well it's, it's, I think it's a legitimate question. It, it, it would be if it hadn't been asked ten times before, and I'd answered no each time. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's look. In the end, we took the decision for the reasons that we we gave and we yeah. thought were right. And this is probably the single most difficult decision I ever took, yeah. um, both in respect of Afghanistan and in respect of Iraq. And it derived from the same thing, which is my belief, and I still think this incidentally today, yeah. that we have a, um, this fundamentalist extremist threat that is based on a perversion of the religion of Islam, but is still there. And we have to deal with it. And, you know, that's a judgment. And some people may say you don't, yeah. or you should deal with it in another way. And that's a disagreement. Now, this isn't question time. So we have an audience of people who aren't interested, not interested, they are, but they probably aren't as au fait with the nitty gritty as you were and are as Prime Minister. So I'll just put it in terms of you went into Iraq to find weapons of mass destruction. You were told they were there. And you went in, and it was pretty chaotic. I think a lot of people would say what happened. There were no weapons there. Waste of time? No, because um, Saddam Hussein had used chemical weapons against his own people. Thousands of them had died. Yeah. He used them in the Iran-Iraq war, so where were a million then? casualties. When you went in? Well, that is then the Iraq survey group after the Iraq war, yeah. then detailed what happened. What happened was that he put his program into abeyance, yeah. he got rid of the weapons, but he kept his scientists and he kept the but laboratories. no weapons? No, that's that, true. That's the bottom line, really, isn't yes, it? Yes, but the bottom line is also that, as the Iraq survey group and other reports have found, that he retained the weapons, he retained the know-how, and had he been allowed to, yes. he would have reconstituted the nuclear that, but that, chemical that, weapons program. And I don't program. mean to be glib, but that could have, would have, should have. He didn't have weapons no, there. No, I agree with that. So the whole thing suggests to me that you and possibly President Bush were sold one of the most grisly pups in modern history. Except if you take the 10 years of broken resolutions, the use of chemical weapons against his own people, I think... But the you, weapons you've got still to... weren't there. Like, is your argument, does your argument help you sleep at night? My argument is an argument that I believe on the basis of a threat that I believed then existed and I believe now. And I just say this to you, Ryan. Yeah. The most difficult decision you'll ever have to, or I've ever had to take, or you'll ever have to take if you're in these positions, yeah. is a decision that is life and death, literally life and death. I know, we've seen and so you, much I know, it. and you don't take it lightly. Sure. And when you take it, you take it on the evidence you have, which was and false. Which, which was, well, it wasn't all they false. They told you is, there were weapons there. I know, they weren't there. It was false. Yes, but the evidence was also that he had them, that he was developing yeah. them, and he had used and had developed them. Yes. Now, it is true that he put his program into abeyance. So, that is true. Yes. But he retained the desire to reconstitute that program. Now, if you accept that, so that's the actual fact. That's, that's, right? that's, that's the, then that's the issue. The, so let's go on yeah. the basis of what we know now, yeah. not, not we what we know We still have weapons, then. by the way. Yes, but we still have the scientists retained, the intent yes. retained, the laboratories yes. retained. So might, okay. could, should, yes, maybe. Yes, exactly. But nothing but solid. I know, but hang on. Would you take the risk of allowing him to do that? We know what he did before. He developed them and yeah. he used them. Now, you may say that we could have used sanctions and contained him. Fine, you can take that view. Yes. But I took the view then, and I take it now, that with this man and the hundreds of thousands of people who died under him, it wasn't worth leaving that risk in place. And I say this to you because we're about to face the same issue in respect of Iran. Yeah. Would you have gone in anyway? It's not if I've gone in anyway. We went in on the basis we stated. On a false premise. It wasn't a false premise because he was in breach of the UN resolution. Yeah, but the weapons weren't there. Yes, we've just we've, been yeah, over we've, this. We've done that, I know I, that, but that's I what know. I'm trying to figure out. I, I, know, I know you're trying to figure it out. And I'm trying to explain to you okay. why we took the decision and why I still believe that he was a threat. Were you let down and, by intelligence? Well, I've said already that the intelligence was wrong okay. in certain respects, but I would want to make this clear because we're about to face the same decision sure. in respect of Iran. Yeah. The real issue is, do you take the risk of a man like that who's been responsible for what he has been responsible okay. for, having the possibility of weapons that, as we saw, in New York that day, yes. these people will not kill 3,000, they could kill 30, they could kill 300,000. If you talk about capability... No, that's not a, a risk I would run. I appreciate that. You talk about capability, military or otherwise. Uh, Iran, 
Should Iran be dealt with in a similar, in a similar way? Uh, look, it would be a disaster if Iran gets a nuclear weapon. So should Iran be dealt with in a similar way? I think you have got to try sanctions. You've got to try diplomacy, but I think you can't rule anything out, including military action, if they, if they carry on developing nuclear weapons capability. And the reason for that yeah. is because it's exactly the same decision. And, you know, what I've tried to do actually in the book is explain to people these are not easy decisions. They're complicated decisions. And actually political leaders take them in good faith, not in bad faith. Okay. Right? So what is important is to understand that when you are faced as a political leader mm -hmm. with, say, this decision, do you allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon with that regime, with the values they have, with what they're doing in the Middle East at the moment, which is exporting terrorism and instability right around that region, do you allow those people to get hold of a nuclear weapon or not? Now, my answer to that is no. So if you were sitting in that happening. seat, you'd have to take that decision too. Or a similar one. Um, well, it, it, there's one or, or, the, or other. the other. I appreciate that. Yeah. Tell me about the sitting in Downing Street having a cup of coffee in the morning and listening to, say, a million people outside protesting. Did, did those protesters, and that's that, the enormity of it at the time, give you pause for thought? Of course. Look, it's not them that gave me pause for thought, simply. The awesome nature of the responsibility yeah. and the decision. You should have pause for thought all the way through. But here's the thing. Yeah. In the end, you have to decide this way or that, right? There is, unfortunately, no third way in it. The number of soldiers that have died, the British soldiers in Iraq, and the countless number of uh, Iraqi civilians that have died. Have you ever had a moment uh, of a night where you might have shed a tear and said, this is horrific? Did you ever cry about what's happened? As I say in the book, you wouldn't be human if you didn't feel emotional about it, and I actually explain. Uh, one occasion when I, when I did, when meeting the family of one of the, the soldiers. But let's also remember that if I'd taken the opposite decision, or if America had taken the opposite decision, there were also people dying under Saddam every year. Just one little thing which is worth pointing out. Under Saddam, the child mortality rate in Iraq was the same as the Congo. Now, it is down to a third of what it was. That's 50 or 60,000 children, extra children living every year there. So when you look at the history of this, unfortunately, this is not a case of this decision leading to bad consequences, this decision leading to good. It's a decision with difficult consequences either way. When you arrive into a, a, a situation like this, a live television interview, and you come through the gates and you have people chanting uh, with the placards and so on, and they're shouting war criminal and they're shouting at you. Are you a war criminal? Of course I don't believe that. But why, I mean, why, do they, why are they calling you one? Oh, Ryan, you know why they are. And, and no, they're no, perfectly entitled. Look, I'm, I'm not going to explain it. I don't have to explain it. They can explain it. But in the end, you can try you know, I, it. I, of course I, I, can, I can understand it. But you can't take decisions on the basis of people with placards. You've got to take decisions on the basis of what you think is right. Do, do, does their opinion matter, do you think? Of course their opinion matters, but their opinion can't determine it, everything. Look, one of the first things that you learn in politics, I'm afraid, and this is a lesson in political leadership, is that those who shout most don't deserve necessarily to be yeah. listened to most. Right? Everyone should be listened to equally, irrespective of the volume of noise. So, yes, I had to listen to people who were opposed to the decisions I took. There were also people in favour of the decisions I took, yeah. including, incidentally, many, many Iraqis. Um, I remember Jerry Adams sat in that seat uh, last uh, season of this programme and I asked him, do you think you have blood on your hands down through after all the, the conflict and so on? And I put the same question to you with Iraq with a view to as somebody who was involved in a mil military uh, struggle, war, whatever you want to call it. Do you ever feel sometimes that perhaps you have blood on your hands? No, I feel that um, I took a decision that was incredibly difficult. Yeah. Um, I know many people disagree with it, but I took it in good faith. And all I ask people to do is to understand the other point of view. Okay. I understand this. Would, would you do it tomorrow with the same information? Um, I know it's a bit of a, a well, it, question. Well, it, it, it is, it is like, really, because it, it's a, it's it a hypothetical like, yeah, question. I know it is, but but I, 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 in answer to the question, do, do I still believe in the light of what we know now that Stan was a threat? Yes, for the reasons I've just okay, given to you. Okay, well, that's extra. Why did you resign as Prime Minister? Ten years. Too long? Um, yeah, and also it become, became very difficult for me to stay within you know, the party circumstances and so on, and, and, you know, 10 years is a long time. I think in politics today, you're, you're lucky, frankly, if you get two terms. Yeah. Um, 
I was, you know, halfway through my third. Did Gordon Brown make life unbearable for you? Not unbearable. Um, Did it you make it difficult? It's difficult from time to time, yeah. yes. But as I say in the book, you know, if you want to get the Gordon thing right, could he be difficult? Yes. But was he brilliant? Yes. Yeah. So that's the balance. Do you like him now? As a, of course, I, I, I like him. Do you consider him. him a friend? Absolutely, but we disagree. Did you go with him? Probably. Um, but, that was uh, a big pause now for you, Tony Blair. Uh, it's, it's, you know, when you work with someone that closely for about 25 years, you know them extremely well. You, I, there's many things I admire about Gordon. Okay. We had a disagreement about policy in the end. Do you drink too much? What is this in here? Gin, neat. Uh, well, that's great. <laughs> Get it down, yeah. mm. uh, you. Um, you talk about drinking. No, do I know. It's very, I talk about drinking. One of the things I wanted to do with the book yeah. is make it different. Yeah, well, you do that all right. It's a, it's a good read. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> we'll put that on the back cover. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, have, um, we'll discuss it over a pint afterwards. Yeah. No, but tell us about the drinking thing. It's... Why did you put that in? I, I, it... I, I, I put it in because... Well, tell us what you One put in, because people don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, no, I, I put in that, that I, what, what, what some of my friends who, who really do drink say is the most pathetic and sad admission of drinking they've ever come across, which is I used to have a gin and tonic and a couple of glasses of wine um, with, with my meal. Yes, I know. <laughs> John Reed, uh, you know, the former Secretary of State, yeah. said where I come from in Glasgow, they give more than that to the budgie. <laughs> uh, um, so it wasn't exactly a... Um, no, I, yeah. I, I think one of the interesting things I tried to do in it is that what, what happens in modern politics is everyone wants to know more about their politicians. Yes. Right? And, you know, if you think of the politicians of old, um, you know, Church and Lloyd George and all these guys, I mean, no one ever knew anything as much about them as they do about us today. And and therefore, liked to drink, didn't he? Uh, he, he did. And the rest. Uh, um, Sorry. And, you know, the, the thing I tried to do with the, the, the book, therefore, is to say, Here's what it's like from the other perspective, okay. from a human being, because you are, in the end, you know, we've just been talking about really difficult decisions I took. In the end, you're a human being uh, who's put in a, an ordinary human being, put in an extraordinary situation. And so I, I wanted to kind of try and explain that to Okay, people. and you do it really well. The book is it's utterly engaging, I have to say. As political memoirs goes, they can be quite turgent, but uh, you've seemed to, yes. it's very conversational. Like, I, I, do, do, do I understand that you wrote it longhand, is that it? And I wrote it myself and I wrote it in longhand, and yeah. I also wrote it, I kind of took, so there are chapters that deal with issues. Yes. Because my experience, again, of political memoirs is that people, when they look at, you know, say my 10 years, they may be interested in one aspect, but not another aspect. Yeah. So I've di divided it up like that. Can I ask you about it? Because obviously, given the, where you are this evening, uh, you converted to Catholicism quite swiftly after leaving office. Uh, what took you so long? Um, you know, I've been going to Mass for, I don't know, 25 years. Yes. And my kids were brought up as Catholics, and Cherie's obviously a Catholic. Um, were you a closet Catholic as Prime Minister? Uh, well, I went to Mass every week, but I just... If I'm absolutely frank about it, I had enough on my plate by then without throwing this into the mix. Um, so I just decided to wait until I'd left. Yeah, because you can't be, what, can you not, you can't be Catholic Prime Minister or... You, I think you can now, that? actually. Uh, but it wasn't so much that. But, you know, if I'd, if I'd you know, in the kind of media environment I, yeah. I was working in, if I'd also then converted to Catholicism, heaven knows what yeah, would yeah. There would have been all sorts of theories about all the things I'd done and why I'd done it and... The, Pope had ordered me to do it or something, I don't know. Um, <laughs> nothing uh, changes. No, nothing, nothing, yeah. nothing changes. But it's also part of, you know, I was uh, actually in the White House again l this week with uh, President Obama for the Middle East peace talks. And yes. you look at the press, the way they go after him now, I mean, it's unbelievable. Mm. It's just part of the modern world. So when you've got a very personal decision, you kind of want to take it in a slightly more easy atmosphere. Did you find the, because you had to dance with the devil, didn't you, with the press? I mean, you, you knew how to play the game so well. And then, did you find they suffocated you in the end? Did you find all that, the, the attention just... I just think it's the way it is today. In, in modern politics, is a brutal business. Um, because you've got a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week media environment. It's very competitive. You've now got all the blogs and the uh, internet. And you have to rise above it, really. Because if you get, you know, you, you just, you've got to see the... And you've also got to see the funny side of things. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's not actually in the book, I don't think, but one of my earliest lessons in politics was when I was Prime Minister was having to laugh at yourself. And I, I remember actually going to... I speak French. Yes. Right? But not as well as I thought I did. <laughs> and I decided to do a live 
uh, press conference in French with the French Prime Minister. And so a journalist got up in French and, and asked me, are there any policy positions of the French Prime Minister that you desire to emulate? And I meant to say in French, there are many policy positions of the French Prime Minister I desire to emulate. Instead of which, um, I got one of the words wrong, and what I actually said was I desire the French Prime Minister in many different positions. <laughs> uh, so, um, <laughs> which is, uh, <laughs> made it, you know, it's an yeah. interesting example of the entente cordiale. But yeah. it, it, I'm uh, curious to know which Prime Minister it was. It was Monsieur Jospin. If you no, Lionel Jospin. Of course, well, he was after your own heart politically at the time, of course, wasn't he? Well, uh, and in every other way, obviously, after that. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Can I ask you one final question, Tony Blair, if I may, before I let you go? Um, which is, I suppose, a lot of people have said, you used the word legacy with you know, your, the release of your book this week. And I am curious to know how you'd like to be remembered. Obviously, when I talk to people all this week about interviewing you, there's a sense that what you've, what the, the efforts you put into finding peace on this island were, were extraordinary. The people will, will uh, hold, hold you in great regard for that, lots of people. And then others will say, oh, that man, he's, he's, he's all about Iraq, and he's, 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 this is the war criminal thing I was talking about. Where's it going to lie? I mean, you are the, the architect of third way, you and Bill Clinton and all the rest of it, neither yeah. left nor right and all the rest of it. What, how would you, have you, whatever about the media writing it, whatever yeah. about your own life, how would you like to be remembered? Do you know, first of all, I won't be doing the remembering. Uh, someone else will. But and in a parlour game somehow, I know, yeah. but you know, I, I honestly don't know. And I, I know that's a bit of a um, um, <laughs> weird thing to say, but I don't know. Because I think that in the end, what, you know, I started as, the whole point about the book is it's a journey. Yes. And the journey was I started as a politician that wanted to please all of the people all of the time. Yes. Now, by the end, I was wondering if I was pleasing any of the people any of the time. Yes. But nonetheless... I came in the end to think the only way you do this is to do what you think is right and hold to that. And so, in a sense, that is my legacy for me. And, and how others judge it is up to them. Um, you're welcome to Ireland. Uh, Thank you're you. signing books in Easton's tomorrow. And I know that if it all goes pear shaped and they hound you out of the United <laughs> Kingdom, that your children hold Irish passports. Isn't that right? Um, I think so. You should talk to your wife more. They do. Uh, right. Um, <laughs> She was here this yeah. day last year, you know that. I she know was, she was yes, there, yes. Uh, here, yeah. rather, and she was, uh, she was on the show, yeah. Yeah, she was telling us lots of things, so apparently right. they hold passport. So go and dig them out just in case it goes In case out. I need one. Uh, it's the book, as I say, that's, that's the book. It's a good old tome. You obviously wrote a lot of uh, full scale pages there with your pen. I, yeah, it was. But it's, a ter it's a tremendously engaging read, and whatever your politics, I think people will uh, learn an awful lot about you. It's been a pleasure to have you on the programme. Thank you very Tony much. Tony Blair.